the beginning of the service, I read a uh, passage of Scripture, and I'd like to uh, read it again from Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act. How many say, Amen? Amen. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. You know what he does? <laughs> he changes your desires. Yeah. Yeah. He changes your desires. And if you are, you feel like your prayers are hitting the wall, and you look at that scripture and you go, yeah, right. Maybe the desires of the heart need to be changed. Maybe you need a new a definition of what it means to delight yourself in the Lord. David got this. This is a Davidic song. This was before Calvary. This was before Jesus. This was before Pentecost. And yet, David understood this, that the important things, the things that you delight yourself in, if, if, if you are delighting yourself in the Lord, that He is going to reciprocate and give you what you desire. And here's another Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and what? He will act. We live in a world of half-hearted commitment and high expectation. Whether that's in a secular way of looking at things, the least I have to do to get by, a lot of people live in that way today. What's the least I have to do for the most amount of money? What's the least I have to do at my job? I clock in right on time and I leave right on time. Don't ask me to do anything else. We can act that way with God. What's the least I have to do to escape hell and make heaven? How can I put in my time and then come before God by saying, aren't I so wonderful I went to church today? not what this means. Commit your way. It means your everything. You give him your everything, and he will act in your life. Sometimes there are scriptures like this that become memes on social media, and they get a lot of likes. They get a lot of hearts, and they get a lot of those praying hands, which someone really ruined my day by telling me that was high five. I thought it was praying hands. But when it comes to walking it out, sometimes we give up way too soon. We've been in this series about spiritual things in church. This is week six, and said it many times that it looks kind of funny when you think about we all well everything spiritual thing in church, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes it's human spirit. Sometimes we get off in the flesh. And you know what? That's okay. We, God loves you anyway. We all mess up and we all make mistakes. Even the most well-intentioned disciple is going to fall short. But in this whole idea of spiritual things in church, the, the focus is on the gifts of the Spirit from 1 Corinthians 12. Now, we're Assembly of God Church. We're Pentecostal Church. There's no shortage of messages about the manifestation of spiritual gifts. But I have been dragging this out on purpose because I want us to understand more than some list of nine gifts that we all try to figure out and say, well, now, did, did God use me here? Or was I, do I have that? You know, stop. Stop. We, we want to understand that the reason that God has done this, first of all, is that it's all about love. Right? It's all about love. Love for one another, love for God, and love for people who don't yet know Jesus. Right? And then we talked about what is the way of the Spirit? How does the Spirit operate in our lives? And that we have to understand His ways if we're going to come into it. And every week we've, we've gone a little bit deeper, and sometimes we took some little detours. And last week I read to you 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, and we took a lot of time to look at it. Well, this week I'd like you to hear it. I have a different translation. Just listen. 
1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11 from the New Living Translation. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. By the way, in the original, it's plural, gifts, gifts of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what's being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Walking in the Spirit, the Spirit-filled life, living for Jesus, it's the way that God intends for us to walk. It's what He expects us to do. It's what He has made available to us. Too many times in church, these gifts being used cause envy. They cause disbelief. They cause pride. They cause arguments. None of that is a fruit of the Spirit of God. God has created through Jesus to have resident gifts in the church, as we read in Ephesians 4, those who, I guess we could say, full-time at one particular gift. But this list in 1 Corinthians 12 is not that at all. We're speaking of when we get together to worship, we can expect these kind of things happen. doesn't mean we make it happen, but we cooperate with God. We cooperate with the Holy Spirit. I want to I want to ask you a question, and I don't, I don't want you to answer out loud. Just think about this. Well, let me make a statement first. I've been doing this long enough, going from church to church for a, a while and then pastoring. I've been on this end of this building, of, or buildings like it, thousands of them, for a lot of years. And I pretty much guarantee you that somebody in this room or watching by live stream, here's that talk about being used in spiritual gifts, and you go, yeah, well, yeah, somebody else. That's not for me. That's, that's for professional Christians. That's, that's for those people that everybody sees that, you know, make the loudest noise and jump and shout and scream. You might even, there might even be someone here who says, yeah, well, I don't, I don't really think I have to, do I? And I don't know if there's someone here that is feeling that way. If, if they're not in this room, there's somebody watching that feels that way, if you're honest with yourself. Let me tell you something. No, if you're born again, you don't have to go deeper. If you're trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation, your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. If your main focus is to stay in Christ, absolutely. As long as you remain in Christ, you're good. But I want to ask you a question. How can you remain in Christ and remain the same? I really want to know. How can you remain in Christ and remain the same? I don't know how you can. It, it takes more effort to remain unchanged in the presence of Jesus than it does to just go with them. At some point, you got to get out of kids' church. I love you all. I want to read some scriptures this morning. They're going to be on your screen as well to encourage you that the normative practice of New Testament Christianity, New Testament Scripture, overwhelmingly supports this. 
that if we're not moving deeper in our relationship with Jesus, we're going backwards. There's no room for good enough in the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about works. Huh? Get me? Get me. Do I need to? I'm not talking about works. I'm not talking about earning favor before God. You're born again. God loves you. He, he favors you. He calls you his own. You're on your way to heaven. You've been redeemed. There's nothing you could do to make God love you more. I'm just saying. But he loves you so much that he says, not only do you get your sins forgiven and get a new life and get to be in heaven someday, I got all this other stuff for you. And it's not so that we can sit back and say, look what God has done, you know. It's say, yes, God has done this so that I can what? Fulfill the commission that he gave to his disciples. And if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, it means you're a little Christ, Christian, little Christ. It means we are designed to be and live like Jesus. John chapter 19, verses 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I'm sure there were people standing by the cross that thought he meant his life, right? It is finished because he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. But that's not what he meant. You know that, right? He meant the plan of salvation that God had prepared from before the foundation of the world. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit always existed. Let that blow your mind. And in the fullness of time, when God decided it was the right time, He sent Jesus. He sent His Son to become a, a baby born in a manger, born very humbly. And He went through His earthly ministry, His life, His persecution, His death, and then His resurrection and ascension. But Jesus said when he gave his last and, and exhaled his last lung full of air, it is finished. And we call that the finished work of the cross. That means that everything that God planned to do for his children from the very beginning was completed when Jesus gave his life. Because Jesus was the only 200% that ever lived, fully God and fully man, the only one who had the credentials to pay for sin. So that you and I, 2,000 years now, on that side of Calvary, can still trust in that shed blood of Jesus for our salvation and for our freedom, for our overcoming in this life, for our healing, for our, the, the, the Holy Spirit filling us to operate in these magnificent supernatural gifts of the Spirit, to bless one another, to reach a world that's lost. When Jesus said, it is finished, that's what he was talking about. Not just squeaking by someday in the sky when I die. Me, oh my. Here and now. Victorious overcomers. The finished work is Christ, but the commitment is ours. Will we step into that? Will we position ourselves in the right place? 2 Corinthians 5.17, familiar passage of Scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You know what? How about, how about any, any uh, volunteers? Anyone here, when you were born again and you looked in the mirror, did you look different? Huh? If, if you were fat, you were still fat. If you were skinny, you were still skinny, right? Tall, short, male, female, the only options. Sorry. No, physically nothing changed. I mean, your face may have been a bigger smile, all right? But it didn't change anything. So what's he talking about? What is Paul talking about? A new creation. You look the same. What has passed away? It's that old nature. It's that, that mindset. It's, it's your soul 
right? And then the person you are deep down inside became new. You didn't always lose the habits. You didn't always lose the way of speaking. You didn't always even lose your thought process. But from the very, at the very deepest level, your spirit, you were made brand new. But you know what? That's just the beginning. I'm telling you too many Christians today, they stop there. They remember a date. They said some sinner's prayer. They came forward. Somebody prayed for them. They joined the church. And they said, well, that's done. It's not biblical. It's not New Testament Christianity. It's not. Romans 12, 1 to 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. By the way, that's brothers and sisters, okay? By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Hard to believe, isn't it? That even our bodies, think about it, imperfect as we are, if we present these bodies as a living sacrifice, the physical matters to God. The physical matters to God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You know, the King James says, which is your reasonable service. This is, this is nothing special. You get what I'm saying? This is, this, is, this is discipleship 101. This is the basics. This is the basics. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy except over God, which is your spiritual worship, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable that if Jesus shaves, saves, shaves you, <laughs> that if Jesus saves you, you give him everything. Everything. No compartments. Do not be conformed to this world. That, that means the unbelieving world. When, when we read world like that, it means those who don't believe. Don't be conformed to the unbelieving world. Don't do things the way the world does. Don't just go along. Don't just, you know, if you know something is wrong and something is ungodly, don't go along. Don't be conformed. But... Be transformed. Metamorpho. What's that sound like? Metamorphosis, right? Same Greek word where we get the, the root for metamorphosis, the caterpillar to a butterfly, right? Be transformed. Let God make you into a butterfly. Not literally, of course. Somebody will say, Pastor Beitzel says that we can become butterflies. <laughs> but be transformed by the renewal. And you know, I can't pronounce that Greek word. Brother Dan probably can, but I can't pronounce it. But you know what it means? It means complete change for the better. Complete change for the better by the renewal of your mind. Complete change for the better. Not just a little scrub here and there. Not just, well, I tried didn't go so well. Now, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. But by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Not three wills, one will. I've heard people say, well, there's a good will of God, there's an acceptable will of God, and there's a perfect will of God. Well, the grammar doesn't tell us that. The grammar says, here is the will of God. What is the will of God? What is good, acceptable, and perfect. Nothing in there about good enough. And don't you understand that that same grace, the same faith that you needed to receive Jesus as Savior is the same faith you need to do that. And it's the same power. It's the same work. It's the same finished work of the cross that makes that possible. That's not out of the ordinary. 
That is basic 101, your reasonable service. One of my favorite authors and revivalists from the past, you've heard me quote him many times, Leonard Ravenhill, English revivalist, had a real way with words. He said, revival is the Spirit's passion within the believer to know and obey the total will of God. And why do we call it revival? Because when you're saved and God begins that sanctifying work in your life, that excitement you felt, that decision that I am all in for Jesus, when that starts to fade and and you start picking up the dirt of the world, that's why we need revival. Revival has to refer to something that once was, or it's not revival. Evangelism is not revival. Revival is revival. It means, yes, you're born again, but you are getting filthy. Your your mind is not being transformed. See, our our spirit is saved, but that mind, man, we got to let him change our mind from what we think about things to what God thinks about things. Who do you trust more, your own mind or what God thinks? And I'm telling you that there are some circles in our society today that this sounds extreme. This sounds fanatical. This is New Testament following Jesus. We've we've made some substitutions for it. How many are familiar with Jesus when he says, ask and it shall be given to you, right? Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Let me read that passage from Matthew 7 for you from the New Living. I want you to pay attention to the verb tense. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Excellent translation of that passage. It's a present imperative. We sometimes read it in other translations like ask, like you do it once. No, it's not what it says. It says, ask and keep on asking. Yeah. Seek and keep on seeking. Yeah. Knock, keep on knocking. God help us. God help us when we get too satisfied. God help us when we talk about this type of imperative action and language as if somehow we're going to wear God out when it's what He wants from us in the first place. He wants us to be seeking. He wants us to be knocking. He wants us to be asking. And we ask with the right motives. Why? Because we're delighting ourselves in the Lord, not in ourselves. Another Ravenhill quote. The only reason we don't have revival is because we're willing to live without it good enough. I may have shared, I won't go into detail, but some things you can share in a small group. We used to say, when I was traveling on the road, we used to say about all the road stories, some of them we couldn't share. Not that they were dirty or anything, but just the context was missing. But uh, there were times we actually made up names for churches. (laughs) And good enough assembly topped the list. Yeah, or when you show up to set up and the doors are locked, that was maximum security assembly. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> good enough, good enough. We, we know how to do this. We know how to do church. We do three songs. We do the offering. We do this. We do this and that. And we're out by this time, and everybody leaves unchanged. No average services. None. That doesn't mean that I'm going to always get up here and wow you. I don't mean that. I mean it's an attitude coming into it. No average meetings ever again for the rest of my life. I, 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 want no, I, want, I want no average. I want us to grow. I want us to ask and seek and knock. I want us to experience Him more deeply all the time. I've done this too many times to just get up and just do it by rote. I ain't going to do it. I'd rather go do something else. Church. We, we have to be going forward. We have to be going deeper. 
You look at a world that is in bad shape, a lot of the blame comes right back to what Christians do and the attitude they take. And I'm not talking about marching on Washington. I'm talking about just simply being who God created you to be and not giving up, not getting complacent. Hebrews 11:6, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For one who comes to God must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. It's impossible to please Him without faith, but yet we will do all kinds of other things to try to please God. Did you hear the way I sang that song? Did you hear the way that sermon went? Did you see how I cleaned those windows? Did you? I'm not, not knocking anybody who does any of these things, but we can really start thinking that God's getting a pretty good deal. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Without saying, I don't understand all of this, but I'm willing. Can I let you off the hook? I don't understand all this. I haven't arrived. I know some things to be absolutely true that I've not yet experienced. But I guarantee you I know they're true because the Word of God tells me so. And because I trust the Word and take it over my emotions and my feelings, I'm going to walk by faith. Because I've seen enough of this play out in my life to know that this can be trusted. He's not requiring blind faith. It's faith in God. It's faith in the one who's never been unfaithful. It's faith in Jesus who completed all of this on the cross so that we could live like this. If we are going to fully embrace what the Spirit-led and Spirit-filled life is, we have to be properly positioned in Christ. Positioned in Christ. This is different then your position in Christ, let me explain. If you're born again and you've been redeemed, your position in Christ is as if you'd never sinned. Right? There's, a, there's a, something that God does that we can't do, and that's forget. We, we are absolutely who He says we are. That's our position in Christ. Being positioned in Christ is understanding that to have that deeper walk with Him and a better understanding of what He has designed for us to walk in, we have to be in the right position to receive that, I guess we could call it, heavenly download. We, we make prayers like, uh, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to our midst. And he's going, I did. I did. It's in the type of church, Pentecostal. That's when I sent the Holy Spirit. I already did it. God, be with us. Yeah, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So, it's about us lining up with him not about trying to get him to line up with us. That's what it means to be positioned in Christ. And sometimes to be positioned in Christ, it means that some of the other places that we have been, we need to not go anymore. It doesn't mean sin, necessarily. It might be perfectly okay for one person to, to remain here while God is working, where the other person has to be somewhere else. We have to be properly positioned in Christ. And the only way we're going to find that out is to seek Him and to know Him more. And I can't tell you exactly how to do that beyond the basics. There are some things you're just going to have to figure out. Figure it out. Ponder it. Pray about it. Don't be in a hurry. It's, it's that process, right, of becoming more like Jesus. It's, it's that hunger in your heart that says, I don't quite know where he's leading me, and that's okay. 
It's that I am going to purpose in my heart to, to get positioned in Christ where I need to be so that I can understand this next step he wants me to take. Positioned in Christ. What's some practical ways that we can talk about that? Well, the first one is this. Number one, everything that you will ever need in this life and in the next has been paid for by Jesus. It's all been paid for. You know, when we make plans here, you know, I think about, ah, oh, man, it'd be nice when that mortgage is paid off. I'm going to need a car soon. Wish I had the money to just be paid for, right? And we, we worry, we manage our money, and we should manage our money and be wise how we spend it. Everything you need to be positioned in Christ has already been bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus. You don't have to beg God for what he already has made available to you. Everything you need, this life and the next, has been paid. What can we say? What does that include? His love, his provision, his peace, his overcoming, the riches of heaven. You know the important things, the things money can't buy, protection, direction in life. And yes, yes, supernatural empowerment. Here's another one. Everything is a walk of faith. Everything. Everything is a walk of faith. It's all by faith. If we could see it, touch it, hear it, smell it, we wouldn't need faith. It's all a walk of faith. From the moment you trust Jesus to pay the price of sin and believe in your heart that, that he has paid everything, that you are free that you have been changed and that you will be changed and that you will miss hell and make heaven, all of these things, that, that you can live and experience and thrive in this life in ways beyond anything maybe you haven't ever even learned in church. Everything is a walk of faith. It's all received by faith. Third thing is, there's one perfect will of God, and He wants you to walk in it. God's will for one person specifically may be different than another's, but His will, good, perfect, all of these things, His will, there's one perfect will of God. It means things that honor God things that are true to his character and nature. There's one perfect will of God, and he wants us to walk in it. Well, here's a, here's a big one. God wants to change your mind to his way of thinking. Oh, just let him do it. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that's like everything. Well, I can't do that. Cool. Let God change your mind. Well, I could never, great, let God change your mind. If I can't change your mind, at least let the Holy Spirit do it. Let Him change your mind about the things you just think you have to have, that you're going to spend all your time on and all your money on. Let God change your mind. Let God change your mind about the things of the supernatural where we say, wait a minute, my mind and my flesh and all of this, this doesn't make sense. How can this possibly be? Stop. Let God change your mind. And then when you get up tomorrow, do it again. Let God change your mind. Right here. Be rooted and grounded in this. Here's another thing. It's God's work, and it's all been done. This, this idea of seeking after Him, of going deeper in Him, about exploring the, the supernatural uh, for His honor and for His glory, it's all finished. It's all done. It's not your goodness. It's not your holiness. It's not your intelligence. It's not your spiritual bracket you put yourself in, because God doesn't do that, but we do. It's not... Deserved. It's not because you're better than, smarter than, or more spiritual than. 
It's all God's work. Here's, here's the last one. There's only six today, but I'm sure we could have more. Enjoy the journey. Can we enjoy the journey? Sometimes I, I think we are more worried about the outcome than we are the process. The process is where it's at. The process is where it's all at. That, that's where life is. That's where liberty is. That's where the excitement is, is in the process. We get thinking one plus two plus, and we make these equations. Well, how will I know when just enjoy the journey? We're not, we're not waiting to be saved. That can be done. That's the born-again experience. But this sanctification, this being more like Jesus, this letting God change your mind, this opening your eyes to new possibilities, this, yes, I can talk about Jesus to that person. Whatever it is, just enjoy the process. And we're all in different points of the journey. We all excel at some things. That's why we're different. You know, that's the other thing we've been talking about. These gifts, they're all different. We're all different. Everybody's different, right? Some of us more different than others. But uh, <laughs> enjoy the journey. Trust them. Just figure it out. Doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? Figure it out. Put in the time. Don't worry about when. Focus on the journey. Team, would you come? God has made provision for us. to know Him on a deeper and deeper level. He has made provision that He will change our desires if we'll let Him, that He'll change our want-tos if we let Him. This whole law-based thing from the outside in, like the lists I talk about, the two lists of what to do and what not to do, doesn't work. Some people live their whole lives like that. Well, I don't dance and I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go the girls you do and all that kind of <laughs> not that we should do some of the some of those things on the list we shouldn't do and some of the things on the other list we should do but it's got to start here and let God just take us on a journey if we're willing let him change your mind be grounded in his word Still the number one bestseller in the world. All kinds of translations and study Bibles and flavors. And some of them have red print in them, Jesus' words. Some of them don't. Some of them commentaries about this thick. Some just like this, which is kind of a good preaching Bible. Just, just the verses. It's been made available to us through the work of some men and women who paid dearly to keep this available. There's countries in this world you can't do this. But it gathers more dust than a lot of other books do. Definitely gathers more dust than our phones. Good thing there's Bibles on there too. <laughs> 